So our speakers tonight are Anthony Sonnenberg and Dean Diderico. I first met Tony a little over a year ago in Fayetteville, where he was a visiting faculty member at the U of A in ceramics. I knew he was a really accomplished ceramic artist, but I was most interested in his installation work. As someone once noted, looking at his installation is a bit like being in a where, Where's Waldo closet. <laughs> As you look closer, you see more and more. And I really love that about artwork. Tony earned his BA in studio art with an emphasis in Italian and art history from the University of Texas at Austin in 2009. He then earned his MFA in sculpture at the University of Washington in 2012. Tony's held a myriad of teaching positions and most recently was the adjunct professor in ceramics at Hendricks College. After a lull in creative outlets following the completion of his MFA, Sonnenberg got his first solo gallery exhibition, which catapulted his career and it's not slowed down since. Dean Diderico is a curator. From 2010 to 2020, as a curator at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, they presented exhibitions with LaToya Ruby Frazier, Joan Jonas, Paul Ramirez Jonas, Nicholas Mufaraj, MPA, Wu Sang and Fred Moten, Gina Pan, Pegu Yang, and others, often accompanied by new commissions. These exhibitions traveled to the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, the Queens Museum, and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. Pretty impressive. The Derrico's 2020 Curatorial Fellowship from the Etant Donnais, the French American Fund for Contemporary Art, supported ongoing research on Claude Cahoon and Bouchra Kavili. A previous Curatorial Research Fellowship from the Etant Donnais supported research on the French artist Gina Pan, as well as practices by contemporary French artists. Diderico's writing has appeared in catalogs published by the CAM in Houston, El Museo del Barrio, Studio Museum in Harlem, Perez Art Museum Miami, PS1 MoMA, and Rutgers University. So please join me in giving a warm Hendrix welcome to Dean and Tony. Thank you so much for the, for the introduction, and thanks to everyone um, for having us here and for organizing the recording of this talk. It's, a, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I actually thought, you know, by way of, by way of starting, okay. that I have a, um, an interesting kind of story to tell folks about the itinerary that Tony <laughs> planned for us today. Um, so when we got in, we kind of, I said, okay, Tony, you've got to pick me up early. Um, uh -huh. We're staying actually at a beautiful bread and, bed and breakfast downtown. And Tony decided that there were two things that we were going to do. So the first is that we took off and went to uh, Y for the Dandelion Festival. Daffodil. Daffodil, Daffodil Festival. <laughs> Sorry, I keep saying Dandelion too. I would go to a Dandelion Festival. That would also be they, fun. And the, and the good people in Y would not like hearing that either. So the Daffodil Festival, which was incredible. You know, we saw really, really amazing flowers out in this field that had been planted by the folks who are, are part of the Methodist Church there. And then the other side of the day is that we took off from there, and went to the Petit Jean Overlook. Um, so a really kind of incredible travel that we had today. But why I bring it up is because I think the two things that we did are very related to your practice. Mm. The one in, you know, in those, dan in the daffodil fields <laughs> was very much about close looking. So we got in, there was, at a certain point, we were surrounded by these mini daffodils that had the most incredible perfume to them. And it, was, it just felt incredibly extravagant, kind of like what we're seeing mm -hmm. here. Then at the Petit Jean Overlook, you see this vast expanse, and you get this really incredible idea of the big picture and the really beautiful local landscape. And in a way, I think that actually felt to me like a great way to start our conversation about this installation, because I think it has moments of both. It has moments where it pulls you in and asks you to kind of look very close. 
And then another incredible moment where we get to stand back mm -hmm. and take in this entire landscape um, in all of its kind of opulence and splendor. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how, first of all, this piece kind of comes into being and how for you in your practice, you balance that idea between this kind of incredible up close focused looking or mm -hmm. focused creating um, in terms of the, the way that you lay all of these objects out and then what the bigger picture is for you, what it is that, that you wanna kind of begin to, what kind of world you wanna to begin to set for us. Um, well, I was thinking yeah, it makes a lot of sense because I guess there's two maybe kind of models for aesthetics that I was drawing from a lot, which was one was still life and kind of starting from this, I mean, still life is at least 2000 years old, maybe 10,000 years old, depending on where you wanna start. So, um, but I, I think there's a lot going on there about um, playing with reality, um, showing excess, but also having religious themes if you really wanna look at it. But I think um, something that I've been in a weird way kind of rejecting lately is like I just had a show in Miami <laughs> and there's a lot, like. I've never been to a city that has so many private collections. And so they all, these, these super rich people have these giant warehouses and they have these 50 foot paintings and they're beautiful and they're astounding, but they also, they don't seem to have any connection with me or anyone I know, like, cause I don't know anybody that has a warehouse. <laughs> and so they feel a little bit like in that way, kind of neutered to me because they don't seem to have a, a place to have any kind of personal connection or to show the individual. And, and so I think there's something about a still life that really, for instance, um, I can't remember the writers. Uh, I think, uh, do you know Houdon, the French sculptor? Mm -hmm. So he made a statue of the really famous French philosopher. Um, Jean-Baptiste Soudan made a sculpture of... And he was one that got banished and... Anyways, I can't remember his name. Uh, Diderot or something like that. But okay. uh, so this philosopher was talking to a young person who said he was bored and had nothing to do. And, that, and the philosopher said, what you need to do is go down to the Louvre and look at a Chardin painting. Chardin is this 17th century still life painter. And when you see how he can take the most mundane everyday thing and make it alive and make it magical, you will no longer be bored because suddenly you will kind of be able to unlock these other worlds. And so I think there's something really important to me about that. I always thought that's kind of a really, when I was young, I thought it was like this kind of superpower I had as like an artist that I could focus in on things and see details and have appreciation for seeming things that maybe were mundane. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was something that I was really after, thinking things that could be small but powerful and kind of in inverting this really kind of market-driven idea of art and going back to what we were talking about, like art in the home and how that's just as powerful and impactful as a 50-foot painting <laughs> that doesn't mm -hmm. fit in the home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think that's also something building out in my ceramic practice. So I was looking a lot at still life, and I think you see that here with all the flowers and trying to have the little compositions and the little moments and little things all throughout. And then the other thing was thinking about, I think directly like Western religious architecture really and colonial architecture, but I think all architecture and all religious architecture in a way, because I think the other thing that I really like about art is like nature, when you get those big churches and things that make you feel, well, I think, a sense of spiritual connection, maybe? Maybe not a spiritual, well, so then another story is, and I, I said this in my artist talk, uh, or maybe it was in here, but, um, so when you're thinking about Greek philosophy and the balance between um, the, uh, the Apollonian and the Dionysian, so the Apollonian is order and, <clears throat> and like society and, and cogs working together <laughs> in an orderly way, and then um, Dionysus is like nature and the inorderly um, and the animalistic, and the Greeks believe that you had to have two of these. And I think it seems to us that they like, well, why wouldn't we all just have Apollonian? But they believe that if you did not give moments 
for this other side to come out, it would come out in ways that were not good for society, when violent mm -hmm. outbursts mm -hmm. or whatever. So mm -hmm. they would have these festivals where they would try to get um, really wasted so they could have this moment where they called a stasis where you can act literally leave your body and almost get some perspective on yourself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that you needed that animalistic side to come in. And so I, th I think like with the largeness in like religious architecture, I think that that moment of hitting you with so much visually that it knocks you out and goes, who, who, you know, where am I? What's going on? And mm -hmm. kind of gives you a moment of like reset. Uh, it's something that I also wanted to replicate. But I think I wanted to do it with these everyday objects so that it was in a way um, an aesthetic that was big and bold and had the same impact as um, an unrealistic painting will say, but um, theoretically could be made by anybody. And so mm -hmm. in that way, it's kind of like pulling out of um, that kind of really inspiring can-do blind faith aspects of outsider artists or self-taught artists where mm -hmm. they, you know, they mm -hmm. can make these kind of worlds. Mm -hmm. um, without approval from anyone, which I really kind of like. Mm -hmm. um, so that toggling <laughs> then almost between the, the still life and the, the landscape, the kind of mm -hmm. close up and the broader view has a kind of interesting analog then in that, in that shift or that balance between the, the kind of Apollonian and the Dionysian mm -hmm. in that way. I think, yeah. I think maybe kind of one of the things that, that also becomes so interesting to me is kind of thinking about, um, you know, that that's a, a kind of fairly constricted space, right? Um, but what you're doing is almost kind of blowing that open, right? Mm -hmm. By taking all of these things, this is like, feels like in a way, hundreds of still lives that are all kind of next to each other and next to each other and on top of each other and below each other. And so you kind of open up this space of close looking to something that feels more like a, a, it's at landscape scale in a way. Yeah. Well, and I was thinking about something the other night that I, I wonder, thinking about nature and the way nature works, um, I was wondering if there's not, and I'm not an expert on this, but thinking it just of the, the nature of fractals, where like the micro is the macro and how that kind of goes back and forth on itself. And so I think that was also something that I was thinking about, that you could see a small moment of opulence and then see a big, you know, and that they could somehow kind of be equal, but also going in and out just, I think also just pushing you and putting you on the back foot and getting you in a place where you're in a situation or maybe seeing something that you haven't seen before. So, um, how do you mean getting on getting on the back foot? Um, I mean, one of the things that I think is is maybe interesting to kind of point out too is that you know even in this work we also have this kind of back way in, so that folks who are here can actually kind of jump up and you know stick their head out of this area in the portrait, kind of being surrounded by all of this material. And of course, it's like, it's a beautiful thing to think about what the, what the view is for those of you who haven't actually had an opportunity to step behind and kind of come up and just peek out and be in all of this opulence. I think that's also a, an interesting way to kind of think about that inside outside shift that happens in the work. Well, and I, yeah, I think that was getting to a point that I, I'm still kind of working through myself, but so about three weeks ago, uh, I gave an artist talk, and one of the few questions we had was, was talking a lot about opulence and all these different things of opulence and how I wanted to recreate this feeling of opulence and do it in a weirdly kind of Ikea hack way, I guess, <laughs> you know, like, um, or and he kept being party like- Party central hack. Party central hack, exactly, <laughs> yeah. And he, which, which I think is something that I've also kind of picked up from drag, you know, seeing people create Realities, and I think, and anyways, he was like, so I, I just, I'm interested with what, how you see opulence, and I'm, of course, I'm probably gonna be misquoting him, and it seems like you're, you're a fan of opulence, or that you think opulence is good, and I don't know, Mary, do you remember this question? If Mary's here, anyways. Um, but, so I was kind of thinking about it, and at the time I answered that I, I, I wanted, and I think this is true, 
to show that opulence was not a thing that solely belonged to the rich. But mm -hmm. I think really the other thing that I'm getting around is beauty, and by extension kind of opulence for me, I think I want to remember is a tool. Mm -hmm. And that it's not just this thing that rich people have and poor people don't, and that, that signifies that thing, but it, it, the rich people have it and put their money into it because it is such an effective tool of communicating what place they operate in society and trying to get you convinced in the same way. It's like I was talking about, um, thinking about um, reliquaries mm -hmm. and Gothic churches. Mm -hmm. And the reason that those things have to be made out of gold and silver and all the precious stones is because the very church itself is built upon them. So they are this ultimate importance. And then as an artist, you have, the pro you know, you have this really kind of practical problem. How do you show something as important as that visually? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so you have to use these materials that everybody recognizes as the highest. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and the other side of that that I kind of think about is like you think about the French Revolution, you think about the Russian Revolution, you think about all these, a lot of Western revolutions, um, Persian Revolution, all these different revolutions, all those times those revolutionaries have the choice to come into Versailles, to come into St. Petersburg, to come into whatever and burn those palaces down and they didn't because I think they got in there and they realized that it was a tool too good to be thrown away and that they could use it in their own way. So Napoleon doesn't burn down Versailles, he moves into it. And he says, now I am this power figure and how is it this power figure? Because I have the drapes to match. And so I think like <laughs> one thing that really was so evident to me, especially in the early days of like drag was that like you could use that tool too. And you didn't have to necessarily have money beyond your means to do it if you could understand the logic behind them mm -hmm. and unravel that and take the mystery away from behind it and kind of just show the mechanics a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Then you can see that like any drag queen on the corner, any person can create the vision that they want to, even if it's a dime store version. But mm -hmm. it, dime store or not, if the ride is light, it projects the same image. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's a, in the ultimate, it's about empowerment, kind of. I also think that, that kind of what's really in that for me is also a, a lesson about effort in some way, right? So they can be kind of, you know, cheap objects like mylar or bits of tinsel or, you know, silk flowers, things, things that are pretty readily accessible. But when you actually put so much effort into kind of caring about every inch and every square foot and all of that together adds up to way more mm -hmm. than the sum of its parts. So, you know, you could, this thing looks in that way, it does a kind of a, a drag version of mm -hmm. what a lot of those kind of spiritual altarpieces or things like that will do. And I can see where it has that, that pull for you, which is a, a kind of very exciting thing. And I mean, I think it's just, you know, I'm a big fan of history and you just see the story of, of that happening again and again and again of, of I don't know where I was going in this, but people, people um, finding power is about might, but also perception. But I guess too, well, and I remember we were talking about, kind of earlier on we were talking about what we we're gonna talk about, and I was trying to figure out my own thing about like, why was I so obsessed with this project to make it, do, do, do it five times and like, such a pain in the ass to store, <laughs> such a pain in the ass to install. And like, but I, I never kind of got it felt like I got it right. I think this is the closest one because I think this version, I was like, if I'm going to do it again, I, yes, every edge has to be accounted for. Every <laughs> inch has to have something happening into it. And so I think I did a good job on that. But um, I think you did too. <laughs> yeah. But it was kind of coming back to this idea about like when I was growing up in my small town in Graham, late 80s, early 90s, and kind of thinking about what I thought gay people were. I thought like gay people were hairdressers and stage designers and not maybe the people in the spotlight, but the people around the spotlight that made the spotlight work. Uh -huh. And that we somehow had this secret I don't know, inherent line of, of knowing 
what beauty and style and class were. And this was our secret superpower that was kind of underestimated by everybody, but like, you know, gave us the world. And I don't know that that's necessarily a realistic idea. I don't think it's unrealistic. Oh, I don't think it's unrealistic at all. I mean, I think that that idea of kind of creating the spotlight is also something that when we create it, we can often see ourselves in it. Yeah, exactly. And then you really illuminated for me when you said, well, the, re the reason that, they, that gay people seem to operate that line and maybe where that skill comes from is because we are born, and a lot of people feel this way, not in the, the mode of acceptableness. And so queer people from the beginning have to be very good at reading a room and reading an aesthetic and knowing that the difference between them and the aesthetic and what they need to get there. And then that really kind of helped me think like, oh, that's also about dragon and thinking about like um, Pose in particular and thinking about those early ballrooms where people were just like so disenfranchised that the only taste of like being a chosen person was to fake it mm -hmm. until they mm -hmm. blindly hoped they would make it, you know, mm -hmm. but. I think in a way, um, what this brings up for me also are all these issues around safety, right? Because I think what a, what a lot of that kind of idea of reading the room comes from is understanding whether we're in a safe space to reveal our queerness, right? And sometimes you know that that's a, a really fraught spot that mm. one finds themselves in. You can feel, or I have felt in the past, that I'm in spaces where that might not be welcomed. Mm -hmm. And I've also kind of found myself amongst kin in spaces where that was very much celebrated. And so I think, you know, we can, we can kind of rest assured that this is a kind of celebratory and safe space mm -hmm. in that way. I think one of the things though that comes up for me also that this brings up is you know there's the relationship at the at the kind of center there's a video and while we don't mm -hmm. have the the sound on now it's a video um, by an artist um, who was a very famous kind of disco era artist named Sylvester who was a gender non-conforming person themselves um, to have that at the center is also a really a really incredible celebration for me and what it kind of brings up for me is this idea that I guess I'm going to call a kind of um, perverse camouflage, mm -hmm. right? Where um, something, I mean, if we, if we even think about, you know, you being able to kind of blend in, we were joking before when we were taking photographs of you in front of mm -hmm. this, that you could kind of blend into the scene in a way. And in a way for me, that is a kind of perverse camouflage, mm -hmm. right? where you're seeing all of these things that are kind of reflecting back at you and glittering and tinsel moving, but being able to kind of create that space for yourself and for other people to enter into, I think is also a really generative and generous space. And so yeah. that idea for me of perverse camouflage is something that, that feels kind of especially fun. Well, I think that's where like the fractal idea comes back because like the other thing that I like about this project is it's kind of like a recycling and, and a depository, repository of like past work. So these are all, all these images are from me and they were, nothing was made specifically for this installation. It was all made for other things that their purpose was left and then they got in storage and, I, and I'm bringing them all back and kind of putting them in here. And so in a way it's like adding my own history, but it's also seeing that thing of like happening on, on small and big levels. So. Like this helmet here is all handmade, like jewelry, just like this. Um, and that was made to be a photograph about camouflage. And now it's making up a small piece of a bigger thing about camouflage. And then mm -hmm. like this right here was one of my very first costumes from one of my very first live performances. Mm -hmm. so, so this, <laughs> I guess, you know, it's like, that thing about like a piece, a giant wall of camouflage is made out of little bits of camouflage that <laughs> just keep kind of building up and then like, but I think something about that fractal going back from the big and small is it, maybe it helps like, like sometimes problems, nature, the world seems too big, too grand to touch but then if you can put it back into a fractal nature where you're like, this big thing is actually just this small thing. And if I can remember it's just a series mm -hmm. of small things, then maybe, mm -hmm. you know, I can work my way through it. And that's kind of how 
this whole thing got made, right, is it's just a series of steps that I knew I had broken down and could do. So it never, if I was to, you know. There's a, it actually brings up for me also, there's a really beautiful quote um, by a Brazilian author who I love very much um, named Clarice or Clarice Lispector. And there's a quote in which Lispector talks about um, the smallest piece of a mirror is always the whole mirror. So based on being able to kind of hold it in your hands, you can see the entirety of a world reflected in it. And so that idea between changes in scale, right, mm -hmm. is, is very much in that kind of movement from seeing something very intimate to kind of seeing the world reflected in that, that kind of scale mm -hmm. of intimacy, which also I think translates in lots of ways to the emotions that we experience within, within those kind of situations as well. Yeah. I agree. Um, I was joking earlier that you know we could do a kind of where's Waldo moment and and uh, ask people you know points for the first person to be able to find George Washington in here because um, he's in there. But I think also you know what that gets me to is actually wanting to talk a little bit about just some of the some of the materials, right? Just to to kind of like list an inventory of some things. And so some of the things that I've caught wind of in this as I kind of got to explore it a little bit earlier today are the ends of belts uh, that have all of these, all of this embroidery on them. I think that, that that's a kind of very interesting thing and it feels to me very much like a reference to your kind of upbringing in Graham, Texas, mm -hmm. right? And thinking about like cowboy culture and and how much the kind of, you know, the belt buckle and the belt itself are present within that. But then being able to kind of find those in here or, you know, even just the, the kind of situation as well, if we think about memento moris, right? The, the kind of arrangements of flowers that are, are like one mm -hmm. might take and leave for at a loved one's grave site, all of those kinds of things. I think that, you know, I also want to bring up, just bringing it back to this idea of kind of perverse camouflage, that there are also some other things in here. You talked about the, the, um, the crown that's up here. And I think it's really interesting to point out that that same kind of orchid mask um, is the one that um, Tony was wearing in the, the portrait that you mm -hmm. see above it. And so it allows a person to kind of almost like get behind that mask. The other thing though that I, I will point out because I think it's an absolutely gorgeous object is a second mask um, that folks can come and, and have a closer look at that's made out of shells. And these are shells that I was fortunate enough to be with Tony when he harvested quite a few of them on some family land um, up north of Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And this is actually from a point at which that land was the bottom of a sea. And so these are shells that are a kind of precursor, as far as we, we were able to kind of figure out, to um, an oyster. So you can see that they make this kind of little curve. I forget the, if you, I don't know if you'll remember the name of this, but I don't want to no, put you on right the spot. No, it's right out of my head. But I remember it's from, it's like, I think they're from the Cretaceous period. So basically all of Texas, well, basically, we would, if we were sitting right now, 250 million years ago, we would kind of be on a seashore, and then we would be looking toward Texas, and that would be an ocean all the way until you got to New Mexico. Um, and then that ocean would go all the way up to North Dakota, and so these are these shells left underneath. Um, mm -hmm. And I think those in that way, like having something that's, you know, we're, we're thinking about fossils in this case, that are hundreds of millions of years old potentially is, is really kind of mind blowing yeah. and, and kind of mind expanding. And it, you know, we might even think about that in that scale of, of time in that way, something mm -hmm. so ancient to something that's, that's very current, right? The things that are, are kind of recently purchased at Party City or at a 99 cent store, those kinds of things but connecting in that way, you know, there's a, a kind of a much deeper spirituality. I think when we're talking about kind of churches and things like that, 
I'm not thinking that about your relationship to that work as much in a maybe religious sense as mm -hmm. also in a spiritual sense, right? Yeah. Because we can go into these spaces um, and see the kind of soaring vaulted ceilings of a cathedral and be moved by that and be moved by our, our smallness in mm -hmm. relation to all of that. And I think in a way, this is, this is what this installation does so well, is to kind of put us in a space where we as viewers get to use ourselves as a kind of measure for many different kinds of, of experiences, both mm. of, of time, of taste, of, you know, thinking about the economics behind, you know, what, it, what opulence looks like and what's our relationship mm -hmm. to those feelings of opulence. I wonder if there are... Yeah, no, I mean, well, you know, something that, I don't know if anybody else has ever asked me, but it was like kind of one of the first uh, criteria for what would be selected and could be used for this kind of thing was the color is gold and black. Mm -hmm. So everything's kind of gold and black or dark brown as much as possible. Um, and why I kind of picked those colors is because they, they seem to be very telling of opulence, especially gold. And then gold is so amazing because now in the 21st century, there's so many different ways to fake it. And so you can have it on kind of any surface at any price level. So it's a, it's a really um, kind of flattening unifier, um, but also uh, what I think is and, really, a, and a signifier and a signifier, well. but black and gold. I mean, the reason that gold has been such a timeless material is because it doesn't tarnish, and it was this symbol, not even a symbol, but an example of what eternity is. <laughs> because if something doesn't tarnish and it just sits there and it never changes, uh, you know, nothing oh, right. surprises me more than like people will go find a vase or, you know, a pot that has gold coins in it that's been buried for 3,000 years and you, they hit the pot and the coins come out shiny as the day they were, you know, and it's like blows my mind. So, but they also are not colors of things that are alive. And so I thought that, that this, this kind of connection between eternality and classic combinations oh, and, and, and things that have been desirable through time are also things that are not from the living world. Mm -hmm. And so I got really kind of interested in that um, and just, you know, thinking, it just gave me a lot of opportunities to, for things to pick. I mean, I think a lot of my process is kind of like finding a balance between having guide rails that are wide enough that I feel like I'm free enough to do things, but, but tight enough that I'm not overwhelmed by anything at any one time. And so I think, again, it was just kind of going back and looking at those things and trying to take a step back. One thing that I think I've been thinking about and thinking about teaching that, and that, that keeps me going as an artist is to realize if, you're, if, you, if you think of yourself as an artist and you take that seriously, you in a way are stepping in to this line of work that is going on for time immemorial. And your job is, is, is a lot of times the same to try and create visions of things and, and communicate things visually, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I go into a church, instead of thinking about necessarily what, the, what it's trying to tell me or trying to sell me, I think about if I were the person that this cardinal came to and said, and, and I think that these, the other thing that when I studied my art history is, is a lot of these like Bernini and um, all those Baroque people, they went to church every day. Rembrandt went to church every day. They were all super religious people. And so they would have been very clear and understanding about Just think about what if somebody came to you and said, make me a picture of heaven. Mm -hmm. Make me a picture of heaven. Simple. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen heaven? What is heaven supposed to look? You know, like how do you start in any of those languages? And if I was in that situation, how would I deconstruct that problem? And suddenly it's not this unknowable thing. It's, it's a practical problem. I need you to communicate this, this thing that is so powerful and so unknowing that everybody has to come to us. And I think also I, I try to give religion a break because for me, religion does the same thing 
has a role and a job, just like art has a role and a job for me, in that um, people cannot, literally cannot understand what it would be to be dead. Mm -hmm. You know you're going to die. Mm -hmm. But you don't know what that looks afterwards because to be dead means you don't exist. And since you've never experienced anything outside of existence, you cannot mm -hmm. imagine mm -hmm. what existence out there. And it's really fucks you up <laughs> or can or, you know, whatever. And, and especially when somebody close to you dies suddenly or something like the world throws something at your way that is not logical, that is not understandable, breaking down in a way. And I... Well, it, it takes being able to enter a space of imagination. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't know where I'm going with this. Maybe I'm kind of blabbing, but there's something about the same problem of how do you get direction when you're in that thing is, is, this, is the same reason that I think I come back to art and what I think art does for us is it, just, it's, it's, it helps us through. And so I think that's... Also why I'm coming back to Gold and Black is because I think my ultimate thing about art when coming back into it is we are all, I don't know, maybe this is simplifying, but I think we're all really scared to be dead and it's causing a lot of what's going on in the world and has been for forever. And religion and art and philosophy and all these things are all trying to do the same thing. We just all call them by different names. But I guess what I like about that is it reminds you that you are not alone now in that struggle and you have not been alone ever because we can mm -hmm. have art. For me, it's this experience that I am in a long line of people dealing with this problem and doing their best to solve it. And for me, it's art. So anyways, I just think about it, it's just like creating heaven it's just another way of solving a problem. You know, just, you know, even these, these, these most highest things, these things that we think are are unknowable, um, still can have a vision. And, and, uh -huh. and because it can have a vision and anybody can make it, we can make our own vision, right? You know, and to remember that that thing is not permanent, it is a creation. Yeah. So I love this idea of kind of being able, being able to create that space for ourselves if we don't find it somewhere yeah. else. Which I think also, if we kind of think back to kind of, you know, queer, mm -hmm. queer life, right, is something that, that as queer folks, we're kind of quite well aware of, but also well aware of our forebears who have kind of entered entered into same things. But you know, I think also in in a way, it it kind of translates across all aspects. I mean, I think it's interesting. I just got to kind of sneak in, and if y'all have not seen the Walker Evans photographs in there, you know, it struck me also that I was looking at some of those and looking at some of the sharecropper shacks that are in, in those images and seeing kind of small fireplaces in those spaces where mantles have things displayed on that'll be kind of important to a family, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this idea of kind of making do with what one has to put beauty, to put a kind of a sense of appreciating the, the life that we have around us on display mm -hmm. so that we can celebrate that in a way. And I think that, that in its way, this also does that on a, on a very grand scale. Well, I think it, I, I, I hope this is in line with what you're talking about, but I think not only does it celebrate it, but the thing that I think always refrains in my mind is uh, I, when, a, when I was a sophomore in college, um, I took an architecture class, got a D in that class because I just couldn't write a paper that semester. I don't know what my problem was, but loved the class and remember so many things about it. Um, and he had this phrase that has stuck with me ever since, and it is, we build our buildings, thereafter they build us. Meaning you build your architecture, you decide what it's going to be, but after it's there and it becomes permanent, you start to get shaped by it. Mm -hmm. So I think the same thing is true about our objects and the things that we choose to, to turn us around. So I think not only do you, um, I guess what I, what I, what, where I'm trying to get to is, is these things like the shape of a city, mm -hmm. the altar of a church, 
the the clothes that we wear, the genders that we have, all these different things, especially in digital age, um, we have we have choices about what those look like mm -hmm. <laughs> and what mm -hmm. they can be for us. Absolutely. And then those choices can then matter because then they they can change who we are. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things they I've been doing. They yeah. they they create space for us. And I think that's what the other thing that I thought was so this secret power about gay people being behind the spotlight. Because by creating and knowing what the spotlight should be and what it was, we made the world. Mm -hmm. right? Like whether they knew it or not. So I, I, I guess that's, that's what I'm thinking about. And maybe this is in a way that kind of perverse camouflage. That perverse camouflage, well. but also kind of talking about a lot of the practice has been going kind of steadily towards focusing directly on decorative arts which mm -hmm. is not, as far as I know, still a cool thing to be doing if you wanna be a capital A artist, you know, who has the gallery in LA and New York and they have a gallery in Britain and then they, they you know, you know this, this, when you're going through grad school, this, this lofty idea of like what art is. But when it- I mean, even if it comes down to it, we think about the, the relationship between, sorry, in the institutions, you know, that are showing sure, yeah. this work generally decorative arts is a department, right? Like the painting department or the sculpture department. They're generally kind of kept separate. And usually the decorative arts are also kept kind of away in their way from the so-called fine arts, right? The painting, the sculpture, all of those things. Where, and, and I would maybe say that the kind of domestic arts, right? Mm -hmm. the, the things that the utilitarian objects that we're using every day, those are somehow seen to be lesser objects. Which I think, yeah, because which I think is a is a kind of false a false dichotomy that's been set up, and I think one that that this kind of easily starts to help us begin to have a conversation about how those notions, those kind of binary notions, can start to be overturned. Well, yeah, because the other refrain that I went through grad school that I think really kind of shows like the, I don't know, double standard hypocrisy is, is the person is political. So that's where, and I think that goes back to this idea of the fractal nature that just thinking about what you have in your house is as important in a way as what a bank looks like or what Donald Trump's penthouse looks like or what the white, you know, these, this, this, it's possible that the choice of vases and the choice of pictures and whatever, regardless of cars, in your house shape you as much and decide who you are as much as what the president looks like, what these things that are images of a nation, you know, which we think define, you know. And so does, it, does that make sense, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think sometimes... Yeah, they shape, e images shape the world in that way. And, and I think that was the other thing, you know, just, again, this idea of, like, opulence is not a side effect of being rich, it may possibly be what keeps people rich because the opulence is the image. I think that's a nice way yeah. to think about it, yeah. I, maybe we should also kind of open up, I don't know if folks here have questions or, or thoughts or even observations about the, about the work that are coming up for them. <laughs> you you get points for that. I have a question. So, uh, you know, the three shows that we have here right now with Walker Evans and the fireplace that you're describing and the kind of precious treatment those objects have in a really sparse environment. And then in the Delita Martin show, uh, objects are really important and they came from her grandmother and they have a lot of power for her. And I look at these, and there are a lot of things from Party City, but it also seems like there's some really precious objects in here. And I'm wondering if there, um, if Tony, if there are any, you know, objects in here that have a particular emotional connection for you that um, are powerful in your own life and anything that you might want to talk about? Um. I guess I would say, I think in a way almost 
everything is important to me because I think I understand my world and my own history and, and my relationship to the world through objects. So, and, and what kind of illustrated to me this is, is my, my, I have two older brothers and um, my parents were kind of the age about like, well, when mom and dad should die, what do you want and what do I want? And, and, and I want all the objects because I want, I want the thing from the grandmother and I want all that, but I could care less about any of the pictures. And that's all my brother wants. He said, you can have all the stuff. I don't care anything about it. I want the picture, you know? <laughs> and, and so it, it just, but for him, you know, the picture marks the moment and he has that thing. But for me, I go, oh, I have this, one of the first times I ever went to a big flea market, I got these pair of, of they're French and I don't know where they are, these kind of portrait heads and I've had them for 20 years and it reminds me of, I don't know, those two things. Maybe one of the, the first objects that I really, really fell in love with and felt like I have something nice, you know, that, uh -huh. that's, that's and, and this, I just I can't think but going back to like a lot of what I'm saying and I think it has so much to do with making Anna and, you know, and like uh, that, you know, that kind of thing about, so, so two things. I guess I guess they're important for me for two reasons. One is this thing is in a way a document of the history of my career and kind of a personal history and kind of where I've been and where I've gone and and what things have made the cut and what things have gone away. Um, and then uh, the second thing is this idea that if I'm smart enough and I have a sharp enough eye, I can find the objects that rich people would own and don't appreciate, but I will have them and one day I will die and all I really want is people to be fighting at that auction. You know, <laughs> like to be like, this guy had, because I'll go to this auction, I'll be like, this person had a lot of cool stuff, I bet they were a cool person, you know? <laughs> so, uh -huh. uh, so some people think, you know, like that's kind of a depressing that one day you'll die and then these will all just get sold off to everybody, but I, but you know. I think of it as a challenge, <laughs> you know? So I, I think it's, it's also just me trying to prove to myself that this idea that it's all, it's all just about like, are you smart enough? Are you, you know, can you, can you look through the surface to see the understructure and then get the power? Because then suddenly you know how things are made and you're not kind of blinded anymore. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I guess that this comes, comes back to why this, I've done this thing so many times and there's always been more and more audience participation in, and I guess it's just to keep highlighting that thing that you have a choice. You can be affected by this image or you can be a part of it. And it's really only a matter of you stepping behind the scene or not, but I think it's important for me to remind people that you can. Um, you can make it, you can borrow somebody else, you can, you can do whatever, but, but it, the, there's so much more of a choice than you think. Mm -hmm. Well, you seem like you, I have an idea, but I yeah, I have something you know that as as a curator, I think that that there are these things, and and I think it's it's very germane to kind of many of the things that we're talking about, right? Where there are these value judgments that we place on things, and so the idea being that maybe taking a selfie is not really a, a kind of an engagement in a deep way with the work. I would kind of argue there that somebody's desire to actually engage at all is a great stepping stone, right? If it actually is something that's as amazing as this, that also beyond that, it pulls you in and it makes you wanna explore, that, that that's actually a, a kind of very interesting spot. I also think that it's, it's quite interesting as you know earlier when I was here, I definitely stepped up, but I really kind of 
stuck my head through and was had a really fun time also looking around, being kind of behind that space, but understanding that there's this whole world that was kind of created for me and that I was only just seeing a kind of portion of it. And that at the same time as I'm seeing it, I also can be kind of seen by potentially other people who might be in the gallery. And so I think there's a, there's a really interesting duality in all of that that also begins to engage you know, value judgments about what it is to, to engage with or, or look at art that I think this starts to help us destabilize a little bit and you know, kind of change, maybe it shifts those, those value judgments. Yes, of course, in a way it's a selfie paradise, but it's not only that, right? There are so many more ways that we can also engage with the work. Sorry, and that's just me kind of going yeah. off in a kind of curatorial way. Uh, well, I, I think there's, it's funny because the more I think about it, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I do it. Um, one thing that changed my mind on selfies was maybe about four or five years ago, I saw something piece somewhere that was saying, hey, um, that Instagram photo of a rich kid on his dad's yacht is the same thing as that Gainsborough photo of those people showing off their big house and their land. Mm -hmm. Just, but the only difference is, is that thing is 500 years old and so the context for you is different, right? But essentially, they are the same thing. They are functioning the same way and in their own modern day context is doing the same thing in a kind of a way. Um, so, and I would also kind of say that in a way you're making that kind of same space for anybody that mm -hmm. comes in here, right? This is not just for certain people. Anybody walking into this space can kind of walk around the back and kind of have that experience of being the kind of the focus of the frame, let's say. And I think that, that there is a kind of a very generous gesture in that. I, yeah, I've, I've, I've often, like, I've always cho chose uh, Matisse over Picasso because I think Matisse is more generous. Mm -hmm. And yes, he has beautiful women's, and yes, he has things of, of, of paintings, but, but when I look at something that I think is eternal and I think touches me in the soul, Matisse always does it more than Picasso. And I, I think very early on, whether... In art school, whether people know it or not, I think they make choices often to either go with or against desire. And I chose a long time ago to go with desire and to go with that, to, to be like water, basically, and, and say, this is what you, I don't know, I guess because, <sighs> I was thinking about this in the car the other day. I personally, for my own practice and my own way of doing things, do not think it is enough for a piece to only be spinach. I think you can have the spinach with a beautiful sweet reduction glaze and it be something that gives you minerals and gives you energy and expands your mind and makes you a strong, healthy person, but can also be enjoyable to get in. And if I have to trick the kid to eat the vegetables to get them to have it, I will. <laughs> but I just think that to fight the game that, that for principle or for value judgments, to make something too easy is to, to, to say that you are somehow lesser or common denominator. But really, I think a lot about memory and I think a lot about how this work is in a way, my children, the thing that goes on after me, and whatever I need to do to get those images to live, not just for now, but 200 years from now, I'll do it. Because that's, if I think about intent and selfish motivations, I think that's part of it. That's part of what doesn't let me quit when I get rejected, doesn't let me go get a regular job when the political Dialogue is not on my side <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, I need to make this work and I need to feel that when I die, I, I, I think that's a lot of it too. It's just like, what happens when I die? You know, and, and I think I'm not a religious person, but I, I do 
want people to know I existed, you know, and I think so that's something too. And, and if desire is the tool, if desire is my sword to make that happen, then I will. Or the hook. Or the hook. Or the carrot and the stick. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a unique perspective from where I'm sitting. Uh -huh. And for, I've been here several times. The movement that comes from the air conditioning unit uh -huh. and the way it makes it look alive because it is twinkling and sparkling. I can just barely squint, and you are just part of it because you're golden black and you're sparkling and you're sitting right under that face. And it's just, it's just an interesting perspective. This is this kind of perverse camouflage that I'm talking <laughs> okay, about. Okay. Well, when I was making this helmet, I was thinking about camouflage, mm -hmm. and that camouflage job is to make you to blend it into an environment, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to give myself the choice of what's the environment I want to blend into? Because we think camouflage is for the woods, but does it have to be? What is its job? It's to make you blend into an environment, but it doesn't have to be, you know. Bark and leaves. Bark and leaves. <laughs> Interesting. Like all those Pose episodes where they're trying, where, you know, black queer people are trying to not just be drag queens, but look like businessmen, look like army captains, you know, and all those things, because that's camouflage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is what they refer to as realness. Yeah. And what, what Sylvester in the, in the soundtrack to this song is, you make me feel mighty real. And so it is this thing about being a kind of a understanding that one is outside is, a, is in a way a kind of pretender Mm -hmm. but is seen also as a, as a kind of participant. And it is this, this idea of camouflage and how much we, we reveal and how much we hide all at the same time. Um, I don't know, I have kind of a question also a comment. Um, I'll mix that together, but um, <laughs> I remember in graduate school we would play like the ad strip game and we would sit down in front of the seats and just kind of, you know, come up with ad strips as a way of and so, like, when I sat here and I was watching this and I was listening to pop, I just kept, like, just death, death, death everywhere. But also, you know, the, um, you know, eternality, we were talking about the gold. And I think one of the things that I love about this piece is that there's, like, an implosion mm -hmm. um, that it, like, um, and an explosion at the same time. Mm -hmm. oh, and nice. I feel like um, it just goes in and out for me of, uh, of that like death rebirth cycle. And, and um, it's just marvelous how many, how many things this piece does. Um, and I just, uh, I don't really know that I have a question exactly, just that I, it's just that was kind of my sense of it was um, implosion, explosion, sort of um, death and regeneration. It's just marvelous. I like that idea too because it is that kind of energy, right? The, the energy of kind of concentration and the energy of expansion, which I think is, is what this does so, so beautifully. So I think that's a that's a very, and I love that you're also kind of thinking about it in terms of rebirth as well, right? because that's something that does feel very present in this. Even if we kind of think about how do you take a kind of simple piece of, you know, otherwise crappy gold decoration that one might stick in a kind of flower vase or something like that and turn it into something that's so splendid. And I think the last thing I have is that you had mentioned the kind of the Gainsborough um, campaign as, and the selfie and like all of our efforts say, I was here, I'm here, I am mm -hmm. a unique individual, you know, in this, like, long arc of eternity, um, and I feel like, you know, this and, like, the hand on the cave wall and the games bro and the selfie, and it's just, like, it's such a beautiful continuity. Thank you. I, I guess it just makes me think, like, I've been telling Dean and all my friends and everything, and so me and my partner last year bought a house, 
And so it's the first time I have something that's kind of like mine that might seem kind of permanent. And so it's, I've always wanted to garden. Both sides, as far as I can remember, have either been gar by both grandfathers on both sides and were gardeners. And then their parents were farmers. And then before that, they were in Germany farming. Uh, and so this relationship with gardening and stuff has always been really important to me. And I grew up in North Texas, which is a really harsh place to try to grow things in because it freezes. So you can't have anything subtropical there, but then it's so hot that <laughs> anything else that's not subtropical will die. And so uh, I just would, my childhood is a lot of just like going in the spring and planting things and then trying to enjoy that beauty while it was there and then knowing that the summer would come and kill everything. And I would like some person hitting their head against a wall, like go back and plan again because I know that like eventually things will catch and that soil will get a little better, you know, and it's this, this, this time and this process and this kind of thing going forward. So um, I just think that stubbornness, I guess, is maybe part of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Are there other questions? I don't know how we're, how we're doing for time. Oh, we're right at eight o'clock. Okay. Well, do you, sorry. I was gonna, you wait, there's one last one or else we'll, let's end it. Yeah. Thanks so much to, to all yeah. of you. I mean, thanks to everyone here at the, at the Wingate for having me here. It's been a real joy and, and such a pleasure yeah, to and get I, to see this and to talk with you. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I love sharing it with new people, but it's so nice because you know me for a while and I'm like, what do you think? <laughs> you know, I love it. Oh, good. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody so much Thanks, for coming. Thanks everyone.